Good morning, church family. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day, and it's wonderful to see you all out on the Sabbath day. Even though the sun is not shining, we have sunshine in our hearts, it's not snowing, it's not raining, I'm happy, I'm content. I just want to take a moment to also welcome those of us who are joining online. We're excited that you're with us this morning, and we are just hoping that the words you hear today, the music that you will hear today, will lift your spirits, will get into your hearts, and will let you appreciate the joy that the Sabbath truly is. May we have a word of prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, most gracious God, we are thankful that we are able to be out this morning. There are many who could not get here. We are thankful that we are breathing the breath of life. There are some who are not able to do so. Lord, we ask that you would be with us, be in the middle of this service, be with our musicians, be with our speakers, be with everyone who has a part in this service, and let it be a God-filled, spirit-filled morning for us. We thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to worship together with like-minded believers. Lord, may one of us, all of us, touch a soul, touch a heart, say a word that is fit in due season to encourage each other. I ask your blessings. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Enjoy the service. Good morning again. Our opening hymn is hymn 608, Faith is a Victory. It's on the screen. Would you all stand with me? Take a minute to find the white mic there. Happy Sabbath. 
It's time for our children's story. So if you are young of heart and you would like to come down and hear a children's story this morning, come on forward and we will have a children's story at this time. sitting up front, you didn't get to hear some of the choir members up here singing harmony on that little uh, uh, come and go with me to my father's house. Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. I have a story to tell you this morning about someone that you might know named little Danny Thorward. Some of them out there sounds like they know him. It was me when I was probably about your age. Now, there's some debate at our house this morning about whether or not I've told the story for a children's story before, but I'm going to bet that most of you probably haven't heard it, so I'm going to go ahead and take a leap of faith here and, and tell the story. Sometimes when we're going through life, God has to come in and help us out. And sometimes in ways that we don't want or expect, but we have to trust that God always knows what's best. We also know that in the Bible, God tells us that he's like a father or a parent to us. And sometimes just like a parent, parents know what's best for us, even sometimes if we don't ourselves know. And when I was about maybe four or five years old, we were over at the Continent, which is a, 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 um, a shopping center not far from here, that back when I was a kid was really, really popular. Lots and lots of people would go there to go swimming and go shopping and go out to eat. And it was lots and lots of people, lots of cars, and lots of folks going in and out of there all the time. Now, we had gone over there one afternoon to have a special meal, which was wonderful. And then after we got out of the restaurant, I looked at my sister. Who's in? Is she in here right now? I looked at my sister and I said, I'm going to beat you to the car. And I took off running because I needed a head start because she was quick. So I ran, I started running, and as I was getting ready to cross the road, I felt something that was more painful than I had felt at any time in my life until that point. And I felt myself flying up in the air and coming and landing right back on the sidewalk where I would started from. My dad had reached out and grabbed a huge tuft of red hair, because at the time I had lots and lots of red hair, and he grabbed it and he picked me up by my hair and put me right back down on the sidewalk. And I turned around at him in that moment, and I looked up at him and I said, what are you doing? That hurts so much. And right as I said that, a huge truck came right past the back, back of me, just like this, within inches of me. My dad had seen this car coming when I wasn't looking, and he reached out and grabbed me by, the, by my hair and picked me up and sat me right back down on that sidewalk where I would be safe. Now, just like a parent, God knows sometimes what's better for us than we do. Sometimes we can't see everything that's happening, and we don't know what's going on around us, and we have to trust that God is going to do what's best for us. So that's our prayer this morning. We're going to say a quick prayer that we would trust God and that he would, we would trust that He is going to do what's best for us. And sometimes it may not feel like He's doing what is best for us, but we have to trust that He knows what's coming and He's going to protect us and help us all the way through all of our lives. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the Sabbath day and a chance to be together as your family. Thank you for uh, the blessings of this church. Please be with our speaker today and bless each of us as we go through our lives to trust you and know that you have our greater good in mind at all times. Amen. Come on up, guys, and get a box here.
morning. I don't know if you're all aware or not, but in the past week or so, we have lost three members of our congregation. Last Sabbath, we lost Mary Fran, Shuley. This week, Carlos Dennis has passed away. His funeral is this morning. And about a week ago, our old friend Paul Constantine passed away. I don't know if you remember Paul and many or not, but they moved to Florida. And uh, Paul had Alzheimer's disease, and he passed away. His funeral, I believe, was yesterday. So the song we're singing today is Tears Are the Language That God Understands. And we'd like to dedicate it to those families who are hurting today, hoping that some of them are looking in or that some of them are here. But we just wish, that, hope that this will bring them some peace. Thank you.
people in one big history. That was such a beautiful song. Just I've never heard it before, and it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you for that, and condolences to those families again. I'm going to introduce to you our speaker for this morning, Dr. George Babcock. He has served as an educational administrator and an ordained minister for the Seventh-day Adventist Church for 54 years at all denominational levels, from the local church school to the general conference. Those years included exciting travel, missions and, and service in Pakistan, and then worldwide travel supervising other Seventh-day Adventist schools. He and his lovely wife are currently retired in the Columbus, Ohio area near their daughter, and they are members of our Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. And may I add, they are valued supporters at the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Academy. They come over regularly and help out with whatever they need to and support our school, and we appreciate them. So bringing you our message for this morning, may I introduce to you Dr. George Babcock. I want to say how much I appreciate that lovely music choir. Thank you, Carolyn, for your hard work, too. This is great. I, I was just delighted when I realized they were going to sing when I happened to preach. <laughs> that was wonderful. Now, I <clears throat> noticed the screen. Following Jesus is not for wimps, surely not. But read what's under that, if you can see it. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen. I'm telling you, everybody has trouble, don't we? Sure we do. <laughs> All kinds of trouble with job, with school, with in-laws, with spouses, with finances, you name it. We even have trouble with our kids sometimes. <laughs> but God is always with us, no matter what. And by the way, if you're not having any trouble, maybe that's a sign you're not doing anything for Jesus. <laughs> Think about that one too. Well, you know, when I was born, I was a city boy, born and raised in the city, in Washington, D.C. area. And I think I was seven years old before I realized that milk came from a cow. <laughs> in those days, milk just showed up on the doorstep in a bottle. So if you asked me where did milk come from, I would have told you from a bottle, because that's all I knew. Well, <laughs> I also didn't know anything much about religion or church, since I grew up in a non-Adventist family. Well, fortunately, I had a grandmother. And this grandmother, was my mother's mother, insisted that I be sent to a Seventh-day Adventist church school when I became of school age. And she paid the bill. But without her, I probably would not be an Adventist today. So praise God for a godly grandmother and for the church school. I decided uh, I wanted to be baptized when I got into the sixth grade. Now, somewhere around the fourth grade, I think, my parents moved from Washington, D.C. down to Florida in a little town. And there was no church school there, so I was in public school. In fact, there was no church in that little town. But there was a church in the next town, which was 14 miles away. Well, in those days, the <clears throat> parents in the town gave their children 25 cents a quarter and sent them off to the local movie house, the little theater, because that theater showed cartoons all Saturday morning. 
And parents thought this was just delightful for a quart, get rid of the kids all the morning and half of the afternoon, and they could be entertained watching cartoons. And I used to do that too. But after a while, my conscience began to bother me because I remembered what I had learned in the first of three or four grades in school, and I remembered what my grandmother kept telling me. George, go to church on Sabbath morning. Well, I figured out that I could get to the next town on the Greyhound bus, and it, it cost 10 cents in those days to go 14 miles. And so I 10 cents down, 10 cents back, and I still had a nickel to put in the offering plate. I thought I was very clever. And so, of course, I never told my parents anything. They would have been most upset. <laughs> but anyway, oh, and I had a younger brother, but he didn't care what happened to me as long as he got to see the cartoons and he never opened his mouth. He was the quietest kid you ever saw. And so I would take him to the movie house and I would walk one block further, get on the Greyhound bus, go down, have Sabbath school and church, put my nickel in, and then come back. And my parents thought I'd spent most of the day watching cartoons. Well, I, I don't know how good it is for kids to be deceptive, <laughs> but I was. And, uh, and so uh, I, I had a good time. Well, I finally decided I was going to be baptized. But I told the preacher man, don't say a word to my parents because they'll get angry and I'll get a spanking and I'll just be in big trouble for a long time. So fortunately he didn't say a word. So I went down there on the selected Sabbath and I was baptized. Oh boy, did I keep my mouth shut. Unusual for me, but, but I did and I didn't want anybody to know but you know, I was so happy with what I had done. I was just as pleased as punch, as they say, and so finally the truth came out. Now my father didn't say too much, but I knew he didn't like it. But my mother hit the ceiling. And she said, if you're gonna be this disobedient, and go join up with those people, you can just get out. Wow, that was quite something. <laughs> quite a verdict to lay on a sixth grader. So, you know, I did. I went to my grandmother's, who else? And so, as soon as I was in the ninth grade, she packed me off to Forest Lake Academy and said, go to, go to the academy, which I was very happy to do. My parents did not help with that school bill either. They still didn't like it, but I enjoyed it immensely. Up there, my grandmother lived long enough to see me ordained to the gospel ministry, and I can tell you that was one of the happiest days of her life. Well, but before being ordained, <laughs> I'd earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, all for the purpose of being a teacher and a principal. And I had already learned that being a worker for Jesus was not easy. Well, but my problems were nothing compared to the heroes of the Bible. Just look, Joseph was persecuted because he preserved his virtue and his integrity. And of course, his brothers dropped him down into a 
drive well, <laughs> and then they sold him off to slavery, and then he had some problems there, you remember, and he ended up being in prison for a long time, several years. And then David, poor David, he was hunted all over the place by his enemies, and Daniel got thrown into a den of lions because he was true to his allegiance to heaven. I really felt sorry for him, still do feel sorry for Job when I think of it, but he was deprived of all of his possessions. He was, even he lost his children, that was bad, that was terrible. I, I wouldn't mind losing my possessions, but to lose my children would be awful. But then, besides all that, he was covered with boils from head to toe. <laughs> I've had a few boils in my life, but I can imagine what it would feel like to be covered with the things. Well, even his, his friends couldn't stand to have him around. Well, then there was Jeremiah. Now, he, he was a good prophet, you know. But he so enraged the king and the princes that he was thrown into a filthy sewer pit. My goodness, I had a, you know, the college that I was president of over there in Pakistan, we had several student missionaries. And one of those student missionaries managed to get himself into some trouble. <laughs> Young people tend to do that, and they say things maybe with some of the uh, Islamic uh, folks that they shouldn't say. Anyway, they had this group that were very upset, and besides, Americans were not very welcome anyway. And so he went to see if he could hide from this group, and he dashed into a, into a uh, little shop, asked the shopkeeper, but he knew the shopkeeper, so he said, can you hide me someplace? He said, no, the only place you can hide is out back in the, in the outhouse. You can go jump down in that. And that's exactly what he did. And here he was, up to his waist, and you know what, and that's where he had to stay for several hours. Oh boy, it reminded me of Jeremiah, all right. That's what happened to Jeremiah. Well, uh, there are some more Bible heroes. Stephen was stoned to death. Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake. He was in a shipwreck. He was imprisoned several times. He was beaten with bronze. He was stoned. And finally, he was put to death. Well, then John came along. Now, John was the last of the disciples to die. But he made the Roman emperor so angry that he was thrown into a pot of boiling oil. And when that didn't kill him, he was taken out of the oil and sent to the lonely prison island of Patmos. Well, I found something in the book Acts of the Apostles. And I want to share this with you. John was summoned to Rome to be tried for his faith. False witnesses accused him of teaching heresies. But the more convincing John's testimony, the deeper was the hatred of his opposers. And the emperor Domitian was filled with rage so John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. But the Lord preserved his life of his faithful servant, even as he had preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. Well, John was removed from the boiling oil by the very men who cast him in, and by the emperor's decree, he was banished to the Isle of Patmos, condemned for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, that's, that's tough, tough. 
Now look at this, 2 Timothy 3, 2. In fact, <laughs> everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I don't mean you're going to be thrown into boiling oil or anything like that. They don't do that much these days, at least not in this country. But you never know what kind of trouble will come your way. And again, if you're doing nothing for Jesus, maybe that's why you're not having any difficulty. Well, I'm wondering now if someone would read a text. Boy, do we have a... a James 5, verses 7 to 11. There's a whole bunch of, of uh, microphones here. Is there somebody like to read James 5, verses 7 to 11? All right. Well, <laughs> oh, we've got a whole bunch here. Tessie. Ah, okay. Who, who will read it for us? James 5, there in the New Testament, little tiny book. Read loud and clearly. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest ye be con condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful of tender mercy. Thank you. As a child growing up, <clears throat> I had an intense dislike for snakes. Now, let me be honest. I had a real fear of snakes. And I didn't like lizards and scorpions and spiders and other creepy crawly things either. And Satan knew just where to attack me. And when I got out to the mission field, I mean, here I was supposed to be this dignified college president. Ho, oh, oh. ho. Anyway, Satan knew just where to get me, and he had a heyday. Now, one good thing that my father had taught me was that I should have a sense of humor and always be able to laugh at myself. Well, I can now laugh at some of the experiences that terrified me at the time. <laughs> well, I remember a week after my family and I arrived in Pakistan, I was told to get on a plane and fly over a thousand miles east to what was called East Pakistan in those days. It's now called Bangladesh. So I flew over there and I was told I would have to teach summer school for a month. Well, I had no idea what those teachers needed to know. I'd never been there. I'd never met a single one of those teachers. I'd never been in any of their schools. I didn't know anything much. But I arrived, and I went to a school out in the jungle. And when I got there, it was in the evening, and the, the, the teacher told me that I would sleep in his house. His house was a little mud hut. You had to get down on all fours to climb in through this little doorway. And you could only stand up straight in the middle of the room. And the roof was a thatch roof. Came down. Well, I went in, 
and I discovered that sleeping in this little tiny hut that night would be two dogs, two cats, two goats, and six people. And since I was the highest church officer they had ever laid eyes on, they told me I would have the bed. Well, the bed was about this wide, and it was made out of bamboo, and they'd slice the bamboo lengthwise and then put all the humps together, and you sleep on that. Well, that was just great. Now, there was a bamboo, piece of bamboo pole at the top, you know, like a little headboard, and guess where the six chickens were going to roost? <laughs> on the headboard, this little bamboo pole. I put my head back and looked up into the tail end of six chickens. <laughs> well, of course, there was no electricity in this hut. They had a little tiny lantern like this. And <clears throat> you know what chickens do all night? And I, if I had been smarter, I would have turned myself around and put my head down the other way. But I guess I was too stupid to think of that. So I reached up and picked up each chicken, turned him around, and sat him back down so that the tails were all pointed that way. <laughs> well, they blew out the light. And when they did, that thatched roof came to life with lizards. Dozens and dozens and dozens of lizards. Now, the lizards, I guess, are good. I mean, they're the only mosquito control in the country. And, and these lizards are very clever. They've got little suction cups on their toes, into their toes, and they chase each other through the thatch. And I thought, I wonder if they ever fall. <laughs> One landed on my chest. Scampered away. You can be sure, that night I slept with my mouth shut. <laughs> well, <clears throat> now, the next morning, I had to go visit this little school. Well, there was a little stream, uh, not very big, maybe like from here to the wall over there. And uh, they had a little boat to take me across that little stream. And so I was just, you know, I went to get in and I stepped. Well, <clears throat> there was water sloshing around a bit in the bottom of the boat, but there was also a water snake a few feet long. So I very gingerly pulled my foot away from that and asked the teacher to please get rid of the snake, <laughs> which, which the teacher did. Well, you know, this school had, it was about, it was a mud platform about this high off of the jungle floor. Now this is dense jungle over there, mind you. And because there's, you know, the great Ganges River comes down from the west, and the Brahmaputra River comes from the east, and these two huge rivers join. And when they, where they join this huge delta area, the river is so wide you can't see across it. In fact, there are waves on the river. Well, here was this little school in that situation. Now, in the school, I discovered there were no printed books, no printed material of any sort. Oh, yes, there was something. And that was a very old Sabbath school quarterly. OK. But they, and by the way, this school didn't have any walls or ceiling. But there was a bamboo pole at each corner. And they, oh, they were clever. They had found a chalkboard somewhere. And they leaned it up against a bamboo pole. But that was there to impress me, because they had no chalk. And they couldn't write on it. But so I wondered, what do they do? There's no paper. There's nothing. But they had a big bucket. 
And this bucket was filled with dust and sand. And the teacher would sprinkle this dust and sand on the mud floor. And the children would do their lessons with their finger in the dust. And that's how they learned to read and write. Bless your heart, they were learning. It's amazing what you do if you have to. I thought, well, at least they can add and subtract Bible text. <laughs> well, they did, but the teacher had a unique method of teaching math. When they would do their math problem in the dust, if the child got it wrong, the teacher had a stick and whack the kid in the head. And I explained that that was not the best way to teach math. If, if it were, we just hit every kid in the head and they'd know math. But it didn't, I said it won't work that way. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I ought to tell you about the professional qualifications of these teachers. Uh, <clears throat> One, oh, by the way, in, the, in all of East Pakistan, we had 20 uh, teachers, church school teachers. One of them did have a college degree, and one of them had graduated from high school. All the rest were what we called sub-high school. Now, what that meant was that they had about a sixth grade education. Yeah, but don't think everything was bad, because if nobody else in the village speaks, uh, I mean, can read or write anything in any language, if you have a sixth grade education, you're ahead of the game. And so things were going along well. And, <laughs> I was astounded at how God blessed that church school. It was terrific. Well, I went around and I saw all these things that were going on and I finally got to the place where I was to teach summer school. Well, when I came onto the campus, this was a high school, a boarding high school, and I was to stay in the principal's home. Well, it used to be the principal's home years ago. It was a huge, big British colonial house. Big, many rooms, 16-foot ceilings. I thought, you know, it's like being in a gymnasium. And uh, so it was... Very fine. Well, the people who, the fellow who took me around said, now you've got to be careful about a few things in this house. First of all, there are big windows that open up like this, and these long hooks that you hook the window open. And if it rains, you, and you want to close the windows, you unhook it, but be careful, but look first, please because the little cobras and other snakes like to sun themselves. And if you're not careful when you shut the windows, you're liable to pull a snake down on top of you. I said, thank you for that information. I will be very careful. <laughs> well, then uh, he, he said, Oh, you need to be careful of the spiders. And I had already seen these great, huge spider webs hanging down around there. It was, it was terrible. And then they said, oh, be sure in the morning when you wake up that you shake your shoes out because the scorpions like to go in your shoes at night and be cozy. You can be sure I will take care of that. And, and I thought to myself, there was no, I mean, it was not a surprise to me then when I realized that the previous missionaries who had lived in that house, that family had to be sent home because the wife had a complete nervous breakdown and was sent home in a straitjacket. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I had to live there for a month alone. And, uh, well, you know, it, it was, oh, I should tell you this. There was no furniture in this great big house. It was a two-story house, great big place. And there was no furniture except for one very old army cot, one folding wooden chair, and believe it or not, an old pump organ. Well, I was delighted to see this pump organ because I thought, well, now at least I'll have something to do in the evening. I can come and I will pretend that I'm Dr. Schweitzer in Africa, and I'll, I'll, I'll play some Bach two-part inventions or some Mozart sonatas, and, and I'll just entertain myself. Well, that night, I did sit down at the organ, and I started to pump, and I started to play. Oh, my. There was a commotion, and suddenly, dozens and dozens of, of lizards just went flying all over. They lived inside the organ. And I scared them all to death. So much so that I saw one of them actually lost his tail. Or, they, you know, they do that. Uh, and, but anyway, it was very interesting. Well, you know, I needed... I needed so by that time I needed um, some promises so here are some precious promises and I began to remind myself of these and there's one come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest My boy I need rest because I was on guard 24-7 my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I said, okay, Lord, I don't know why I'm here, because I'm scared to death of snakes and all these other things, and that's all I'm finding. And Satan whispered in my ear, in my ear, George, why are you here? Surely they can find somebody else at the general conference to send over here. Somebody who likes snakes. <laughs> but that would not be me. But what to do? Well, you know, the former college president, or I, you know, I took his place, uh, he had been sent over to East Pakistan to start a new college. And the bandit shot him over there. And that was very sad. I don't think the bandits intended to kill him because, you know, they just stuck the guns through a hole in the wall and started shooting. And they didn't know who they shot, but they did take the car keys. They were going to steal the car. Well, when they realized that they had shot, you know, the white man there who had been there to build a college, they gave the car keys back. But he died on the way to the hospital anyway. Well, I went, I was standing there at the foot of his grave, when all of a sudden, someone shouted, jump back! Well, I didn't know that they were talking to me, but when I hear something like that, I obey first. <laughs> and sure enough, I jumped back, and here was a cobra right where I had been standing, ready to get me. Well, that about scared me out of 10 years' growth. <laughs> and it, you know, this, this, this was not fun. Oh, well, then I had to do something else. I went to see another church school. And I'd spent two days and a night in a canoe to get there. And
And so when I got there, I was hot, tired, and dirty, and I asked the teacher if I could take a shower. <laughs> I'm out in the jungle. What a dumb thing to ask for, because there's no running water. I didn't know there was any, and there was certainly no electricity. But the teacher got a twinkle in her eye, and she said, oh, we have running water. Good. She called the little boy, gave him a bucket, told him to run to the river, fill it up, and run back with it. And that was running water. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then, the whole village gathered round to watch me take my bath. I said, no, I'm sorry. Where I come from, I need some privacy. Okay. The only place in the village where you can have privacy is in the church. Take me to the church. Well, the church, my, oh my, the whole church was less than half of the size of this platform, and it, it had no furniture in it at all, and it was also just one step up from the jungle level. And, uh, but the floor of the church was made out of boards about this wide, and a space, and a board, and a space, and a board, and a space. I said, take your bath in here. Well, at least there wouldn't be any drainage problem. So for the only time in my life, I stripped stark naked in the middle of an Adventist church. <laughs> and sure enough, everybody left me alone, so I was private. Well, I dipped in the bucket and I got all wet. I soaked up from head to toe. And then I was rinsing off. And as the soapy water ran down my leg, I happened to look down. And up in one of between the space came a cobra. Right here. I think I levitated. <laughs> you know, I'm not really sure what happened. But at the very next instant, I was at the door of the church. Only then I discovered I didn't have my pants on. But, you know, I needed precious promises. I tell you. But that wasn't the end of that story. I may run over a few minutes today. But anyway, <laughs> I. I uh, after I got myself, oh, by the way, I went over to where the bucket was, picked it upside down, got an instant rinse job, and quickly dressed and went out. And they fed me supper, which consisted of popcorn that had been popped in hot sand. Think about that. And they had some potato balls rolled in horseradish, but anyway, it was a great meal. And so then they said it was time to go to bed. Okay, where shall I sleep tonight? And they said, in the church. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I just saw a cobra snake in the church. I said, I've got a lovely sleeping bag, and there's a beautiful mango tree out here. I'll just sleep under the mango tree. They were horrified. You can't do that. Why not? Because this is the Sundara bonds. OK, what are the Sundara bonds? They said, that's where all the Bengal tigers live, and they roam around here at night. Well, I have a great choice. Outside was the tigers or inside was the cobras. <laughs> and I knew something about cobras. See, I studied biology. And I had learned that cobras are, for the most part, nocturnal, crawl around at night. And some of the Hindus who were there also in that village, they put out little cups of milk for the cobras to drink at night. Oh well. And so I said, I'll, 
I don't want to stay in her place. And I, I thought about, you know, the three Hebrew youths in the fiery furnace. I, I, I remembered that gentleman who was thrown into the lion's den. Well, only mine would be tigers or cobras, but I tell you, they insisted that I sleep in the church. And so they graciously took my sleeping bag, unrolled it, right over the hole where the snake had been a little while before. And uh, folks, I made my peace with the Lord. And I said, look, I'm here on your business. I said, frankly, I don't want to be here at all, but I'm here. And since I'm doing your will, or at least I'm trying to, it's your job to protect me. Please do it. Amen. I got into my sleeping bag, zipped it up as much as I could. Well, I, I'm not sure I breathed all night long. I, I, I was so still. But the next thing I knew, it was morning. But I could hardly get off of that floor. I had never been so still for so many hours in my life. And I was, I was in a mess. Well, you know, that's the way it goes. And it was about this time I decided I needed more precious promises. And, and here's a couple right here. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Oh boy. Oh, and by the way, when my wife looked over these sermon notes last night for the first time, uh, she said, we have a lot of older people in our church and you haven't told, you haven't given any promises to about older people. Well, here's one. Isaiah 46 verse 4 says, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he who will sustain you. All right. Now some of you gray hairs, you need to know about that. And here's another one, 2 Corinthians 4.16. It says, therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Isn't that great? It certainly is. Well, you know, these promises meant something. You know, I, can, I, I could tell you a story, I won't do it, but it's a story about being shot at in Beirut uh, when I was there checking on the college in Beirut. It, it's called a university now. And, uh, but when I was there, there was fighting going on. I couldn't figure out why is it the General Conference always sends me to places where there are snakes or whether they're fighting with guns and everything. Well, I was standing in the guest room of the college and, you know, Beirut's down on the sea coast and they were shooting guns at the Syrian army which was up over the hill. And the college is up here on top of the hill. So, you know, the shells were flying right over the college. And I was standing in this picture window of the guest room, and I was watching all the tracer bullets. You know, the, the Lebanese were shooting at the Syrians, and the Syrians were shooting over the college down onto the city. It was quite a show. I, I had the light on behind me, you know. <laughs> I made a good target, but I didn't think about that. But suddenly, I got so tired, my legs wouldn't hold me up. I fell onto the bed that was under the picture window. And as soon as I did, bam, in through that picture window came a shell. Went right over the top of me and into the wall on the other side. Well, 
And then I went to the college the next day. And I was in the cafeteria when a big shell hit the dining room, one corner of the dining room. And bricks and glass flew everywhere. Unfortunately, that same shell, as it came flying over the campus, hit an electric wire which fell onto the night watchman's little metal house. He was in there, and he was electrocuted. I'm telling you, this is, as I say, being a servant of the Lord is not for wimps. Oh, and I had to, I, you know, the, the mountains above Beirut are beautiful. And it, it had snowed the night before. Lovely. I wanted to go skiing. I love to ski. So I said, come on, we'll take you. So you went up the mountain, I mean, you know, in the car, up to where the ski lift was. We put our skis on that they had rented for me. And started to go up. I mean, we thought we were going up. And I went to pay for my ticket. And they said, oh no, we have closed the ski lift. Well, why would you do that when it's such a beautiful day? Oh, the Syrian army guys, the sharpshooters are in the woods over here, and they're using all these people going up the ski lift for target practice. You never saw anybody lose interest in skiing as fast as I did. <laughs> Absolutely not. But these promises are, are marvelous. Now, it's true. I could have been killed many times. But God sent his angel to protect me and my family. Uh, you know, we were in air raid trenches many times, you know. I remember being in air raid trenches in New Delhi and on our campus when Pakistan and India got into a war. And then there was this dogfight between a Pakistani saber jet. The Pakistani Air Force used the American saber jets, whereas the Indian Air Force used uh, the Russian MiGs. And so they were fighting over our campus and finally, the saber jet got behind the MiG and shot a heat-seeking rocket, went right up the fuselage and blew that jet to a million pieces. Well, they were going so fast that the pieces landed some miles away. But the concussion right over our campus blew out almost every window on the campus. And we had locked doors taken off their hinges as a result of the concussion. Oh, scared the college students half to death. At least the girls were all crying. But that's the way things went. And then, of course, we had our problems with train wrecks. The terrorists would, you know, pull the spikes out of the rails so when the train came along, it would derail and turn over. Well, unfortunately, that happened to me and my family. We were going on this thousand-mile trip from Lahore to Karachi. And the train turned over. And Sherry and David, my children, came within, as we say, a gnat's whisker of being killed. God took care of us. So, you may not have experiences like these, but you can be sure that as we get closer and closer to the coming of the Lord, that more and more troubles are going to come upon all of us. Now, many of our challenges, they come from within ourselves as we, you know, review our own history our own sins. And remember that the scripture says that the servant is not greater than his Lord. Now just think about what Jesus had to suffer. 
But praise God, he is so full of love and mercy and grace. I'm going to tell a story. Uh, I was warned maybe I shouldn't tell. But I've checked with the person, and they said it was okay. I was preaching on Sabbath, not in the mission field, but here in this country. And I was preaching about, you know, the love and mercy and grace that we need. And I had made a, a big thing about this grace, and I said, we need grace. And my precious three-year-old granddaughter suddenly came running down the aisle, and she said, here I am, Grandpa. <laughs> I tell you, she is, you know, the apple of my eye. And, but, but that's, this is what the Lord is going to do. When we need help, when we need grace, he is right there. And here I am. Come to me. I am full of grace. Now, and finally, please notice this. But you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and to speak for him, to tell others of the night and day difference that he's made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. You know, I can hardly imagine what it'll be like to to realize I have been accepted by Jesus. I pray that every one of you will be accepted by Jesus. Amen. Amen. Deacons, please come forward for offering. So I just have a, a little something to read. And I think we have the deacons. Okay. We have four? All right. Thank you. So what is amazing about the teachings on tithing in Old Testament is not that God demands a tithe, but that God does not demand it all back, since it all belongs to God. Behold the graciousness and generosity of God, who wants people to be able to have life and to live it to the full, not, however, at the expense of forgetting to whom it all belongs. Can you please bow your heads for prayer? Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here today, another wonderful day where we have freedom to worship you and to give to you freely. Thank you for the blessings that you bestow on each of us and to our church. We've had a good start to our year with the church and we ask that you continue to bless us and to bless the people who are wanting to give and enjoy getting to fellowship with others here at our wonderful home church. Thank you for being with us this week, and we ask that you especially be with those families who have been stricken with grief. Thank you for your love and for your guidance and your protection. Amen.
can say is the next time I see some red ants in the kitchen, I'm going to tell my wife one of your stories. <laughs> what a life. God is it. Let's all stand together and sing Onward Christian Soldiers, hymn 612. <laughs> Everyone with me. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before, Christ the royal master leads against the Ladies only, come on, ladies. Sing it out now. Onward then ye people, join our happy throng. Then with our your voices in the triumph song. Glory, praise, and honor this true pain Countless ages, men and angels sing. Sing it out. With the cross of Jesus, marching to war. With the war in the cross of Jesus, going on. I was trying to add a little high school stuff in there. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your blessings. And we do pray that you will fill us with courage and to work for you and let our light so shine so that others may be drawn to you. Dear Lord, we need your help to do that. So bless us all and save us in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>